Well, Lars, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, except for the fact that I'm a little sick. But other than that, I'm all right. So that's I, great. I have a well, coughed off in my mouth right now. That's good. You're prepared. Uh, well, today's a special day. Uh, you've got a, a, a big, big release coming out. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, he's just arrived in the mail yesterday. Um, land is a big deal. Why rent is too high, wage is too low, and what we can do about it. Your book. Yeah, this is. Um, so it publishes today with Shack Simple Press. Uh, we've got the physical book. We've got um, an ebook and an audio book. And um, yeah, it's it's. I've been working on it for, gosh, at least yeah, better part of the year. Let's put it that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what the book is and the main thesis behind it? Okay, so it's right there in the title. Land is a big deal, and the double entendre is 100% intentional. Like, land is a big deal as in land is a very important matter. And then land is a big deal as in it's just like it's an awesome deal. Like, you know, there's there's a, a, a very valuable, like, business arrangement if we pay attention to it. You know, there's a lot of value that's locked up in land. And the basic thesis of the book is that um, real estate is the world's largest asset class. And then the major driving force behind the value of real estate is land appreciation. And um, for some reason, just contemporary economics, even though it, like if you scratch the surface and like dig down, they'll all acknowledge that this is true. But then in terms of like our public policy, we kind of just ignore it. And it's so strange because land is this huge weight on the economy. And when we have bad land policy, it, may, it makes everything worse. It's basically the root cause of the housing crisis, which in turn is the root cause of all these other problems in our lives. And um, the book is here to basically just elucidate why land is a big deal and how um, it causes uh, our, our ignorance of that fact, how it causes all these problems in our lives and what we can, how we can take that knowledge in and, and fix things. That's great. That's great. I want to talk first on what land is and, and then how big of a deal it is. Like you mentioned it's the largest asset class in the world, real estate, and, and the primary driver of that is land. What is land, and, th and then how like how big is it in term if we compare it to the different things like you know financial assets or you know real capital or things like that? Right. So one of the things I wanted to do with this book is I always get really frustrated with a lot of political and policy arguments where people just argue from vibes. Like the other thesis of this book is just is just shut up and do the math. Yeah. So basically, when I talk about so, so one of the things I do in the book is go out to measure all of America's land values is like a major portion of the book, right? And so, um, but first let's talk about what land is and why it's important. Land is basically uh, everything humans don't produce. I mean, that's obviously like the most obvious example of that is like literal land, right? Like just dirt. Um, but it's also like locations, right? You know, you the real, the real estate agents just give it right away. Location, location, location are the three most important things in real estate. And then they'll also have this this this, va this phrase they like to say, buy land. It's the only thing they're not making any more of. Yep. And so the fundamental problem is, I mean, um, to kind of paraphrase William F. Buckley here, is that there's infinite capacity to increase labor and also to increase capital, but no capacity to increase land. We can't make another Earth. We can't make another Manhattan, you know. And so um, – because whenever you're doing anything in the economy, basically the results of any productive behavior get split up between people providing three things, people providing labor, people providing capital, and people providing land. And we can make more land – I mean, sorry, we can make more labor. People can work hard or less hard or more people can work. Um, and we can make more things, more tools, more factories, more machines, whatever, you know, to make ourselves more productive. But because we can't make more land, land really holds the whip hand in the economy. And um, land takes its share of production in rent. And the problem with land is that everybody needs it. You know, um, land as an asset has three unique properties. And those are that it's strictly scarce. It is necessary for production. And you can't make any more of it. I mean, sorry, I already said that. It's, it's, it's scarce. Um, what, I, what the third one really is is that it obtains value from its location, right? And this is a perfect recipe for what we call rent-seeking in economics, which is basically collecting value, extracting value from the hard work of others without contributing anything yourself. And um, 
when I say land is necessary for production, it's literally true. Like, it's impossible for you to do anything without being in a location to do that, right? And the way I like to say it is that you can't work, eat, sleep, or even poop without access to land to do those things on. And if you yep. do any of those things in the wrong place where someone doesn't want you to do it or you don't have the right to use their land for that purpose, you will get in a lot of trouble, right? Okay. You know, even something as innocuous as sleeping. You know, you sleep on a park bench, there's a very good chance you'll get arrested by the police, right? You know, and so... Um, so land's necessary for production and just all human activity. Everybody needs it. You can't opt out of, out of needing it. And then because we can't produce any more of it, you know, uh, especially when we talk about valuable locations, that creates this kind of local monopoly with every piece of land that gives uh, the owners of land intense leverage to extract uh, value from the rest of us. And then there's that third part. Land obtains value from its location. This essentially is... Um, so, so like if you imagine you operate a hot dog stand, do you want to operate that hot dog stand in the middle of the desert or do you want to operate it like next to Times Square, right? If you own a parcel of land next to Times Square that's very valuable and putting a hot dog stand there, you'll get a lot of traffic because of all the rest of the contributions of New York City, right? Things right. that you didn't do, things that the community provided, but yet you're able to extract that value because you're adjacent to it. And so... When those three things add together, basically land becomes this asset class that uh, really distorts the economy when we, um, when we don't have policies that treat it well. And right now we do not have policies that treat it well. That, that, that's really well put. That's really well put. Uh, I want to double click on something interesting you did there. Uh, if you remember a couple, probably a couple of years ago, there's a book that became very popular. It was by a French economist named uh, Piketty. I, I'm sure I'm butchering his uh, pronunciation there. I've only read it. Uh, but it was called Capital in the 21st Century, and it was all about how over time, you know, capital has sucked up more and more. Um, it, it's driven a lot of inequality because it's, it's sucking up more and more of the economic production and taking it away from labor. Um, and he divides things between capital and labor. You divided things between capital, labor, and land, which I think is a really I important thing to do here and split these things out. Can you talk about um, why that is kind of – it's not a unique approach and that people have been thinking about this for a long time, but oftentimes land just kind of gets lumped in with capital in a way that I think uh, you know, misconstrues things in people's minds. Right, yeah, you're absolutely right. So the thing is um – if you go into any classical book of economics, they'll even some a lot of them will just say the three factors of production are land, labor, and capital. But then land will get treated as if it's just a species of capital, right? It's just right. a thing that people own that helps them get more wealth. And um, and so land is really a separate category by itself because it doesn't behave like capital at all. One of the major things about capital is that you can move capital, you can't move land. And secondly, um, I mean, some capital can be moved. But um, you can also make more capital, and you can't make more land. And then the other big thing, and this relates to Thomas Piketty, or Thomas Piketty, I don't speak French. <laughs> Something like that. Um, is that capital also depreciates, right? You right. know, um, capital has maintenance costs. You wear it out. Grades. Land generally doesn't depreciate. Land generally, if anything, appreciates over time as demand for those locations goes up. And um, because of this, treating land as if it's a species of capital really distorts the whole thing. Like you can put them both together and call it capital. And then, yes, Piketty is right. The return to capital is growing faster than the economy itself is growing. And that seems bad. And it is bad. Right. But um, this guy called Ronley um, did a really good analysis of Piketty's work and points out that when you decompose Piketty's category of capital into – um, regular capital assets and housing, you know, the majority of whose appreciation is due to land, then you see that all of the increasing returns to capital are really just to the housing sector, right? All of the returns to just regular capital, like tools and factories and other things like that is, is flat. Um, yep. Because once you appreciate, uh, once you account for depreciation. And so it's really even, even using Piketty's own data what he's showing is that, yes, like the returns to the capital sector are, are outpacing the growth in the economy, and that's bad. But it's not because of, 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 of capital. It's because of land, right? right? And so it's, it's essentially a category area, error, error. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, 
I, I want to move on now um, and, and talk about you know how big of a deal land is. So a lot of people you know would agree with you all the way up to here. Like Paul Krugman, he's like, yes, like you know this makes sense, Lars. But uh, he's like, I don't think land is that big of a deal actually. Like I just don't think it's that big of a problem. It's not this huge asset class that you talk about. Can you talk about um, just how big land is as an asset class and how important it is? Yeah, and so. A real important thing to just like kind of contextualize here is that it's like here we are recording a podcast remotely in the yes. in, in in the the work from home revolution in the future with a metaverse on the horizon and stuff oh, yes. like we're more disembodied and atomized than ever like 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 when, when and then some weirdo like me comes on like ranting about land it's like what am I some <laughs> 18th century peasant like exactly. what, what what is right. land matter in the economy well uh, I have a lot of figures in my book this was the whole point of shut up and do the math. Right. So I wanted to, you know, see if land was a big deal. And you can define that in several ways. And here's the ways land is a big deal. Most of the value of urban real estate is land. Everyone knows with all these million dollar, tiny, tiny houses in San Francisco and and Manhattan that are worth millions and millions of dollars. You're not paying for the building. You're paying for the dirt. You're paying for the location, 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 location. Right. Um, and I have a lot of data in the book that, that supports exactly how shocking that disparity is. Um, then America's land rents, if we were to take all the value of all of America's land and just take it into like the annual land rental income value you could get from renting that land out, um, it equals a, a really sizable portion of the government, of government spending, you know, so we could replace a lot of sales and income taxes, um, with uh, a shift to what what's known as a land tax. Um, and the exact values depend on which budget you're looking at, state versus federal, et cetera. Um, the other thing is that land represents a significant percent of uh, all major bank loans. So bank loans over the past century have just been increasing, increasingly, increasingly just chasing real estate. China is an extreme example of this. Let me get some figures for you here. So over um, in around 1880, bank loans are somewhere like 35% of uh, all real of, of all bank lending was real estate and in 1920 you know that had fallen to like 15 percent now in 2010 it's like it's well over 50 percent it's it's like 58 percent or something in 2010 and and the graph the graph i have only goes till then so i think it's probably increased since up to 2020 and um this is all over the world it's new zealand it's the uk it's um you know, Finland, Italy, Australia, Sweden, you know, and then China, it's like this graph I have here that goes to 2007. In 2007, that was like, what, 15 years ago? Yeah. 87% of Chinese bank loans were for real estate. And we see right now with their massive crisis that they're having right now. Um, So not only is land this huge, it's it's also the largest asset class in the world, according to... um, McKinsey's shown that real estate is 68% of um, the value of all real assets. And real assets are, if you take paper assets and decompose them into the actual atoms that they point to, and it's like just the physical stuff in the world that people own, 68% of all that value is real estate. And um, of the portion that you could consider non-produced assets, which includes land, mineral rights, and... um, that that's about 40 percent you know so it's this huge part of the economy banks then chase this and when banks chase it it pours fuel on the fire because they just constantly bid up the price right right? you know of of a scarce asset that allows you to extract value from other people right (laughs) off of stuff you didn't contribute to the economy it's 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 pretty bad and um from thomas piketty's own work he has some excellent graphs of capital in britain and capital in france and um capital in spain and if you look at these you see these like shifts where back 100 200 300 years ago all the value majority of the value of real assets was locked up in agricultural land and there's been almost this perfect transition of like like half of the world's like real value being tied up in agricultural land shifting almost perfectly to residential land so yeah we all moved to the cities and we got we're, we're not peasants anymore we're not dependent on farming for a living but we are dependent on needing to pay rent somewhere so that we can have a job. Yep. And um, so that so so we still have aristocrats and landlords who 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 basically rule the world. 
Yes, yes. And, and the, the remote rev- revolution has not, you know, we've hit some equilibrium there where it's maybe a third of jobs or something like that, but it doesn't seem like, you know, it, Zuck's Metaverse, you know, 35 daily active users, that was the big um, news from yesterday, and uh, it doesn't seem like we will have it much more innovation in that space for at least 100 years or something like that. So we are stuck in the real world uh, for the time being. And so land still really matters, it seems like to me. Well, and also the thing is, it's not like a bunch of people can move to, you know, some podunk town with good internet and not increase the land values there, right? There's this phenomenon called Ricardo's Law of Rent that when you increase the productivity of an area, the rents basically go up proportionately. Um, and so the issue is like, everyone's like, okay, I'm going to work from home. I'm going to move three hours out of the city to this nice little sleepy suburb. That's really cheap. And it's cheap for about a hot minute until you, all your friends come too. Exactly. And now it's expensive because people are like, oh, well, you're making a really high salary from your work from home tech job. So I'm going to raise the rent. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and and it's this vicious cycle. Well, um, Lars, so I think we've established land is a big deal. In fact, you know, this is like uh, perhaps this thing that is true that, that few people realize. And so it's super interesting to me personally. Um, what's to be done about it? You know, what should we think about? What policy interventions would help uh, alleviate this kind of stranglehold that land has on the global economy? Right. Well, there's a couple. Right. So the one that most people will be familiar with is just Yimbyism, you know, the yes in my backyard movement to basically just save us from the strangling force of people who are like, oh, we're in a housing shortage. Don't ever build any more housing. Exactly. You know, so just pushing back on that is good. The the problem is, is that there's still a stranglehold on land. Right. And um, the um, the solution actually comes to us from a famous economist from the 19th century by the name of Henry George, who at a time was probably the most famous political economist of his time. And the first third of the book is basically a book review of um, his seminal work, Progress and Poverty. And his basic thesis was, why is it that as progress advances, you still have poverty, and in fact, sometimes worse poverty in the most advanced cities, side by side with all this progress? Like in San Francisco, major tech hub, there's just homeless people on the streets right next to just some of the wealthiest people in the world, right? And George predicted this, you know, over 100 years ago, and he also gave us the solution. And since then, basically every economist ever basically agrees he was right, which is why it's so puzzling why they haven't put his policies into effect. And his policy prescription is a land value tax. Now, um, we have property taxes already. The way a land value tax differs is that you don't tax the buildings, And then you raise the rate of the land value tax to almost equalize the amount of um, income or benefit you are receiving from the land, what we call the land rent. Basically, if I owned, you know, a piece of land, like a perfect example would be if I own a parking lot, like right next to um, the Empire State Building, I should basically be paying a tax about because like a parking lot is like basically doing nothing with the land. Right. Right. And I can basically rent that out through just the demand for parking and parking fees. You know, that represents kind of like the natural income of completely unimproved land. Like you should tax me at basically 100% of that parking income. Right. Um, And you should also tax the empire state building. The same rate is the idea. The idea is property taxes punish people for building. Right. And they are essentially encouraging and subsidize people for buying empty lots in the heart of big cities. You know, um, I know of cases in cities where like people have bought large, large empty lots and held them out of use for like 10 years and then sell them for 10 X what they paid for them because they know that as the location, the population increases in that area, there will be more demand for land and it encourages people not to develop, which is really perverse. Um, And the other thing is, and there's another section of my book that deals with this, is that there's really strong evidence that land value tax is one of the only taxes that can't be passed on to its, you know, to the consumer, which in this case would be a a tenant, you know, who's renting from a landlord. Um, It has to do with some special properties about land. But essentially, uh, land value taxes, because you can't make any more land, there's a saying, if you want less of something, tax it. Well, because land is a perfectly inelastic good. It's perfectly fixed supply. If you tax it, you don't get less land. Nobody makes land. So you just eat into the rent seeking of the person who owns the land, which encourages them 
only to hold land if they're going to do something productive with it, which means if we tax land, we'll get a lot more housing. We'll also um, make housing more affordable. And we'll also be able to use the revenue from a land value tax to offset much more inefficient taxes. We know with income tax that um, it's, it's, it's a drag on labor. You know, it disincentivizes, we get less labor than we could because it disincentivizes people to work as hard as they could. Um, and then sales taxes are regressive. They fall mostly on the poor and they're also disproportionately bad for small businesses. Like the cost of compliance are way easier for large businesses than for small businesses. And um, so we can replace our tax system with one that's more fair and that's more efficient and that will encourage more investment, more capital and invest and, and encourage more, um, more, more hard work, you know, more labor. And so basically Henry George's thesis um, there's kind of an extreme vor version of it called the single tax, which is that the only thing we should tax is land. And my position is that's nice work if you can get it. I show a lot of numbers in the book of, you know, whether that is or isn't possible. Um, but I think we can get actually pretty close to it, even if we couldn't realize the ultimate dream in one full swoop. And it certainly would make things a lot better than they are today. So that's that's the main policy prescription is, is the land value tax. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a big fan of this, uh, actually, from a just an economic growth angle. Charles Goodhart of Goodhart's Law, um, he's actually still alive. I, I think this is, this is great. He wrote a paper last year called Post Corona Super Stimulus, and he talks about the potential economic effects of implementing a land tax, a shift to a land tax. Uh, it could increase U.S. GDP in the U.S. by as much as 15 to 25 percent, which could help us escape kind of this, this great stagnation we find ourselves in. Um, and it, it's actually not unheard of. You know, we've had three or four shifts in taxation of this size in the United States since our founding. So it's not like it's uh, this, this crazy thing that's completely out of the, the possibility space. It is very much an achievable thing to do and something we should strongly consider. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And the other thing is that um, there's another aspect to Georgism beyond land. Remember I said there's this thing called a land-like asset. So there's literal land, but there are other things that um, behave like land. Right. Um, one of those is things like electromagnetic spectrum. Right. So like froggy 99.7 is occupying yes. a, a fixed location in the electromagnetic spectrum. And those are resources that we need to allocate efficiently. Um, satellite space. Right. Only like if you're uh, occupying a certain orbital lane, another satellite can't be there. That's a scarce resource. And we need to manage those well. And there's also. <clears throat> mm. There's also depletable natural resources like oil, um, like um, natural gas, um, and then renewable natural resources, which are tied to locations like um, Henry George famously basically predicted solar power by basically saying that, like, as technology improves, certain locations will become more valuable. Like a patch of desert could become more valuable if there was ever humans ever devised a way to capture this, the power of the sun's rays, which we now can do. And we are seeing what we call a locational rent accrue to certain areas. And um, one thing that's interesting is that the Kingdom of Norway, aside, I'm a, I'm a dual American Norwegian citizen. Norway has been doing some interesting things lately with its natural resource management. They have a long history stretching back over 100 years of explicitly Georgist management of their natural resources, starting with hydropower. And um, then their oil, their oil management system was also um, set up under effectively a Georgist regime. Um, and the basic idea there is simply that it's the people who own the resource, right? And so there's a very strong severance tax on the extraction of the resource. But then in order to make sure that there's still an incentive to discover the resource, they have um, some subsidies and uh, to, to cover those costs so that you're taxing the passive extraction of the resource. That's because if you don't do that, you get the kind of situation where we see here more in the United States where um, people will squat on a natural resource node and then political connections get tied into things and, and production gets pushed out further and further and further into more marginal resource nodes because the best ones are being, being kind of squatted on waiting for the price to go up. And um, the Norwegian model has been a huge success in natural resource management, and uh, the current ruling coalition is now pushing for Georgist um, management of natural resources in other sectors. And what I would recommend is that they start looking at the largest resource sector of all, which is land, because Norway famously has very high income taxes. And I think those income taxes are a drag on their economy, and they could 
replace those with taxes on land, and then maybe all the poor students in Oslo who can't afford anywhere to live because housing costs are through the roof would also get a break. So I think it's um, – there, there's there's more to Georgism, which is the philosophy of Henry George, than just land value tax would fix this. But um, but that's kind of the core of the philosophy. But to expand further, you go into natural resource management. That's great. Uh, could you talk a little bit about just uh, the crypto angle and potential applications in Ethereum as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is funny. One of the things is, so I've worked as a consultant in the video game space for a while writing about video games and there was this whole trend of crypto based video games and um some some of the people who become really interested in in georgism come from a crypto background which was kind of surprising to me um vitalik buterin uh was very taken with um the philosophy he, he graciously endorsed my book um and he wrote a paper recently that i thought was very interesting about the ethereum name service which is kind of this domain name service that's tied to Ethereum, basically like .ENS, because that's a, a scarce, it's, it's kind of like electromagnetic spectrum, it's, it's scarce, right? And how do you allocate those efficiently? And so he wrote basically this philosophy of, you know, um, how can we allocate these effectively so that people don't just buy like cool.enet, uh, cool.eth, or Lars.eth and hold it out of use forever, right? Waiting for, like, get, get, everyone knows there's all these people who've squatted all the best domains. And yep. so, um, and, and so he, like, wrote out a policy paper inspired by George's uh, philosophy of how to deal with that. One of the things in the digital world that's a little different than the physical world is that sometimes we can create more of whatever our virtual land is, and so yes. that you can kind of kick the can down the road that way. Um, but in some contexts, you can't. Um, and a lot of that has to do with when the locational aspect sets in. For instance, um, in a lot of the metaverse-type games, um, they've had a problem that rhymes with what we've seen in online games, just old-school games like Ultima Online going back 30 years, which is virtual housing crises, yep. which is um, what's valuable is other people and proximity to other people. So even if you have 10 servers you know, or 50 or 100 with as much virtual land as you want, people want to be next to wherever all the people are. So the digital equivalent of Manhattan will behave much in an economic way similar to the real Manhattan, where land virtual land values will rise and you will have virtual land speculators who hold land out of use and don't use it productively and charge everyone else for the privilege. And then you can't afford rent in the metaverse, which is hilarious to me that that has also happened, that we've so digital dil, we've been so diligent that we've managed to recreate the problems of the real world in the digital one it's amazing uh zuckerberg if you're listening uh we have some policy prescriptions for you here for the uh for the metaverse um uh that, that's great that's great well lars uh thanks so much for coming on to talk about the book where can people find it uh where should people uh where, where should we send people to pick up a copy yeah so it's at it's real simple www.landisabigdeal.com for now, you can only order it directly from the publisher for boring publishing industry reasons. We're going to have Amazon links and all the other stuff and like worldwide distribution um, in, in about a month. And so, um, but for now, you have to order it directly from the publisher at www.landisabigdeal.com. Um, and uh, international shipping is a little pricey right now, but we do have an audiobook and an ebook version that. Um, don't need to be shipped. So uh, all of our international customers, you know, that might be a good option. Um, if you absolutely insist on buying on Amazon, we have a wait list you can sign up for on landisabigdeal.com and we'll notify you. But uh, we'd really appreciate it if you picked up uh, wh whichever the three formats is most convenient for you today. I, I highly endorse the book and especially the audiobook. You might get to hear uh, yours truly on a, in a couple tracks. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's really good. I really enjoyed the book. Um, I, everyone that's read it has really enjoyed it. So I highly, highly encourage everyone to go pick up a copy. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.